Hi, everyone. I'm Charlie Melcher. I'm the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit, and we're delighted to have you here today for our weekly hangout. Uh, we're so excited to have with us today Bryn Muser, who's here. Hey, Bryn, how are you? Great. How are you? Good. So glad to have you here with us. So happy so to be Bryn, here. One of the co-founders of this amazing site called Riot.org, uh, which is a place where they bring news stories or stories and help turn that to action. So at the end of every story, there's an action that you can take to really um, move on the, on the emotions that you might have as you, as you read that story. Um, so Brim, we're really excited to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Cool. So um, we also have an illustrious panel of people to talk about journalism, new, new journalism with us. Uh, John, do you want to say hi? Hello there. How are you? Good. Good to see you. So, John, just give us like a quick bit on, on your background. Sure. Um, well, I've got a, a deep background in media. I come from uh, Viacom and MTV, where I developed channels around the world. Um, I had the great pleasure of running Quincy Jones's company at Time Warner. And I've spent a lot of time in the marketing and advertising world, but also have an extensive experience working in, in uh, journalism and thinking about the future of media and communication in general. And, and doing some work these days with Al Jazeera too, right? Yes, actually um, I'm working on the launch of the Al Jazeera America channel, which will be later this summer, early fall. Very cool. Thank you. Hey Tim, how are you? Welcome. Pretty good. Thank you for having me. So Tim, give us a little bit on your background, please. So I, I got started as an inadvertent journalist just being on the ground during Occupy Wall Street uh, using mobile technology to report live post video and photo through social media and throughout the past uh, almost two years now I've traveled to uh, many different countries covered many different actions political events uh, with a heavy focus on using cheap and reliable uh, technology ultimately to help other people do the same very great thanks for being here so I just want to remind people who are watching with us today that if you'd like to be part of the conversation, we'd love your questions and, and contributions. Um, and you can certainly uh, tweet in at um, at Faust org, uh, and we'll try our best to answer them. Um, okay, so let's start, uh, Bryn, with with asking you a little bit about the origins of Riot. Uh, how did you decide to try to bring news and journalism to activism? Yeah, uh, thanks so much. I mean, for one, I'll start by saying I'm a news junkie. I think that we all are. Um, and I grew up reading the news, and, and I'm still, you know, read the news all day long. So that's been a big part of where I come from. Uh, but most, mostly my past is in humanitarian and nonprofit work. Uh, my partner and I have both been working for the last decade on the ground in both Africa and Haiti post disaster and post crisis areas. And we've been working with a variety of nonprofits and really started to see that there was a problem that nonprofits had with their content, which is that uh, after a crisis would happen, there'd be a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz that would come up. They'd put pictures up and videos up. People would go on, see those videos. But after a while, there was never a reason to return and see the, the good work that these nonprofits were doing. So we really thought, well, what if we could take news and, and show that, you know, even after a crisis or even after a disaster, there's still a problem that's going on. There's still an issue that needs to be solved and really connect that, um, uh, that news story to an action so people could get involved. And then through that, I think, as we started to build it, we realized that there was a big gap in what was available for young people. Uh, to get their news and also to do something about it. And I think the number one thing that we, we heard from young people was, I don't read the news because I feel depressed by it and there's nothing I can do. And so, you know, we're really hoping with Riot.org that we can, we can be a part of that change. Amazing. Amazing. And, and how's it going? Are you finding that people, after reading a story, are really, are really moved to take action? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's really exciting. We have, a, we have a very young demographic on the site. We skew mostly uh, towards girls, which is exciting to see them so engaged. And yeah, people are doing something. I mean, you know, we could take the uh, tornadoes in Oklahoma, for instance, about an hour after it hit when we saw those news images. I mean, because we had spent so much time in disaster zones, we knew that this tornado was, was bad, and we started our own uh, a, a fundraiser on top of that. We raised $40,000 nearly so far. And that money is already on the ground, and it's helping those people through our partners in nonprofits. So we were able to say uh, to, to, to our readers, 
you know, don't just get depressed by this. You can do something, and that money is already on the ground with those families. And there's no processing fees. There's nothing like that. It goes directly from them to us. We were lucky enough to have the band uh, Incubus, who gave us uh, a big matching grant that really got it kicked off. But yeah, it was that's that's a that's a good indication that it's working. We have a lot of people who are on the site, and it's growing. We've only been live for six months, but it really feels like uh, it's growing very fast. Amazing, amazing. Um, so you're really sort of uh, flying in the face of that idea that young people aren't interested in the news or the world around them, right? Because you hear all those statistics about they're not reading newspapers, they're not on the watching the, the nightly news, uh, they're they're getting their information from I don't know John Stewart or Facebook or uh, wherever. But but now they've got a good alternative source. Uh, you know, we certainly hope so. I mean, I, a big part of, I come out of the Peace Corps and, you know, the Peace Corps background is all about how we can, you know, how learning about other cultures is really a key to a better society, to a greater America. So, you know, I think it's, it's really important. I think we can all agree that, that young people really uh, know what's happening in the world, but also have the context to know that, uh, you know, a crisis in Syria has a real serious effect on what's happening on the ground here. And, and as Tim can point out, you know, the Occupy movement has real reverberations for people. And it's a, something that people can, can become a part of. And they also need to understand why people are doing it. And, you know, we want to we make that as easy as possible to, to learn about what's happening in the world and how people can become activists and get involved themselves. So, so Tim, I'm just curious. You, you actually sort of embody this whole idea, right? I mean, you, you were so moved by what was going on. You, you actually... You know, embedded yourself in it, right? The the 21-hour live stream of the Occupy uh, protests. Uh, you, you are um, action in, embodied. Tell us a little bit about how you do that and and what the kind of response is that you get from it. Well, I, you know, I, I I got involved out of curiosity, interest. I, I heard. I mean. I've been involved in, uh, I should say, I've followed news and politics my whole life. I've always been interested. And uh, I was, you know, big into following anonymous and web culture stuff because of my background with technology. So when this shift sort of happened um, in 2011, when all these online activists started, you know, passing around these flyers for Occupy, you know, when it comes to political decisions, I'm not, uh, it, it's a really complicated issue. And there's a lot of perspectives. But I end up uh, going down there just because I, I need to know what's happening. I, I need to experience it. I need to, I need to see. I need to understand. And, you know, all, all I brought with me was a cell phone. But I knew that I could do more than just be there and that it would be, it would be extremely valuable to everybody to have photos and videos of it. And then when I discovered mobile live streaming, it was just a, a no-brainer. I mean, the, the first and foremost uh, important thing was that we were hearing that authorities were confiscating memory cards and uh, and phones so I figured if you know if I do it live then it, it offloads all of the storage to the web and it'll be preserved the whole point is to share the information of what's happening just so that people know because the only way we're really gonna make positive changes is if we have accurate data sets and that's sort of been what's driven me you know this whole time just uh, in regards to uh, everything I cover I feel like there are moments that are really important and that if we truly want to overcome the problems we face, these are the, these are the moments that I feel we need to know with you know as much accuracy as po possible what happened, and then we can all work together. And you know I, I hope people will be able to figure out you know what what they need to do from there. And and you had a lot of people participating with you, right? I mean your form of sort of live stream journalism was not again just one way. You had a Twitter stream running. People were sending you comments and questions, right? They were very engaged yeah. with your coverage. Well, that, I mean, that's that's what's to me the most amazing thing is the the engagement. The the fact that not only do I have people watching as I'm broadcasting, but they're actually helping me do my job better. I'm I'm getting fact checking. People in the chat would uh, make corrections for me. They would also give me tips as to what else they heard was going on. And so I'm taking questions and direction from the audience who in turn became my producer. It was this really, you know, symbiotic news production. Uh, and, and personally, I feel, you know, when you've got 30,000 people watching and they're not, not just watching me, they're watching other live stream video uh, and they're also watching other Twitter feeds, they're, they're helping me, 
you know, to better understand what's happening because I can, I'm only one person who sees one thing. But in turn, you know, my footage combined with Twitter streams, photos, videos, and other streams creates a, a, a much better picture than uh, like individual reports would, uh, would create. Bryn, are you thinking of having some more um, live coverage for Riot? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's that's definitely where we want to go. We're trying, you know, as we grow, that's a big focus, and we really want to be um, uh, getting as many citizen journalists and as many journalists who are on the ground, and especially, you know, uh, the kind of journalism that Tim has really pioneered. Um, yeah, that is such an important voice to us. I mean, you know, now we pull as much as we can when there's a crisis or there's something interesting in the world. We do uh, Instagram feeds or we do Vine feeds now is what we just did a Vine uh, feed the other day about the tornado. And so, you know, as much as the information that we can connect, c collect from the people is really important. But, yeah, live streaming from a mobile device is and that's a dream of where we want to be and, and hopefully we'll get there soon. Very cool. So. Um, do you do you actually think about trying to engage uh, citizen journalists? I mean, act, obviously you do if you're doing a Vine feed. But I mean, do you have people out there looking for for stories for you? Or are you assigning stuff at this point? Yeah, I mean, we always, uh, you know, we have people all over the world who are helping us, and a lot of that is engaging the communities that already exist. You know, I, I, since I come from that nonprofit background, uh, I can uh, very easily call friends from from places far and wide to be able to get footage. I have a friend. Uh, recently in Goma, who's who's shooting a movie in, 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 in the DRC anyway. So, you know, he, there's a lot of um, uh, increased rebel activity. So I said, hey, look, you're already there and you're shooting this documentary. Can you go and, and get some more footage for us and, and tell that story? And so, you know, there is ways that you can engage this community that we already have. And Twitter is an incredible thing about that. So, yeah, we do try to put out the call and try to get as much of that as possible and those voices on as much as possible. You know, I love the fact that, that all of you are using, like, the the latest cutting edge technology to help uh, you know do the reporting to co to cover uh, whether it's vine you know I mean that that's super hot new thing or Tim I know you've been doing stuff with like drones right I, I, I love to refer to you as like the phone and drone journalist uh, to be able to get like aerial shots of things that that news would never be able to cover um, we, we have a question that came in from from somebody following us today asking about Google Plus. Uh, I'm sorry, not Google Plus, Google Glass, uh, and the possibility of that as a tool for, for news coverage. What do you guys think of that? Well, uh, I'm on the waiting list, and it's <laughs> the most painful waiting list ever because of how awesome Glass sounds. The, the, uh, just to make it really quick, I think the most important thing with Glass is that it frees up your hands. So uh, for me, when I have to carry the camera around while reporting, this will all be uh, on my face, and uh, I think you know there's going to be a learning curve to it, figuring out how to point the camera, and keep it steady, things like that. But it's just going to make it a lot easier for me to be in uh, particularly dangerous places when I don't have to worry about carrying things. Oh, that's exciting! Wow, that's really exciting, Tim. <laughs> um, so, John, what do you? What is your sense? I mean, you you've been following the whole current TV thing, right? And uh, Al Gore started that network, and the idea there was originally citizen journalism. I mean, that was basically the initial idea that uh, when the explosion of video cameras and videos in your phones, and that current TV was going to enable this whole world of, of young people with, with cameras to go out and report and tell stories. Uh, and I guess it had moderate success. <laughs> But now, um, but now it's been bought up by Al Jazeera, right? And so that venerable news gathering organization is now going to have a life here in the states. Uh, do you think they're going to be able to do something a little different uh, than what the sort of more traditional news coverage has been? Oh, without question, I think it might represent potentially the most exciting new development in journalism in this country. And why I'm so excited about it is because the there are really two kind of key points. When we started thinking about what Al Jazeera could mean, we started thinking about it in terms of colors. And I'd like to think of it as on this side you have blue, on this side you have red, and in the middle is what I would say is black and white. And black and white means straight no chaser, unfiltered, people don't want to hear from someone else's point of view talking about it, they want to see it. They want to, they want to see it straight from the source. 
And I think that um, what Al Jazeera represents is a very, very serious, very highly respected um, news outlet that is really focused not so much in the personalities. They don't even run the credits of their talent um, at the end of shows. They're, they're, the, the, the news is the star there. Um, I think that it represents an, a pretty interesting opportunity to deliver um, a new style of almost in the spirit of Edward Murrow, like real journalism that, that is designed to provide people with, with as much unfiltered truth as possible. So, um, you know, ironically, um, Al Gore, when he started Current, um, I was, he interviewed me to run the marketing for that channel, though keep in mind that was, that was 10 years ago. And think about how much, how far we've come technology-wise in the past decade that really allows for concepts that weren't, weren't possible, like what Tim's doing with mobile. That really wasn't doable. What we're going to be doing with Al Jazeera is, um, I think, completely forward and groundbreaking in terms of working to bring um, live news into places like bus shelters or live news streaming right into a banner ad, things that things that will allow for people to be able to get a deeper, more intimate experience of, of, with what's happening in their world. And so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very exciting opportunity, and I think that that channel will, um, will have a significant impact. And the last thing I'll say is, is that it's interesting to see that um, all the research is showing that young people are most receptive to Al Jazeera coming to America, younger people. Hmm. Well, that, that's great. Let's pick up on that one second. I just want to welcome a new, a new guest to our Hangout, uh, David de Rothschild. Are you in there, David? Or can you hear us? I am. I can hear you. Sorry, sorry about that. No problem. Welcome. So, David, just quickly uh, give everyone a little uh, short introduction for yourself. So they know yeah, um, I've kind of been, well, hi to all the, my uh, fellow Hangouts. You all look very cool hanging out there. Um, nice to pick up on some of that, and uh, you know, my my background has been in the sort of core space for the last sort of twelve, thirteen years, um, and trying to figure out how do we, you know, take serious issues that um, often people feel disconnected to, overwhelmed by, and make them feel relevant and inclusive, non-worthy. How do we use um, media tools available to us? Um, my main medium has been adventure, so I've done a series of expeditions, um, you know, crossing. The Arctic Ocean, or, you know, for 110 days, and getting kids to blog and tell us where to go. Um, luckily, nobody killed me off, which was kind of fun. You know, <laughs> I'm sure they probably wanted to try. They're like, "Yeah, go touch the polar bear." Um, but we, um, you know, we, we create these uh, series of expeditions. You, you know, obviously, one of them, Charlie, very well. The the Plastiki expedition, which was uh, in 2010, and obviously, um, you helped me tell my story. Um, so it's um, it's been a fantastic. Um, you know, opportunity to use adventure as a way to create cause-related conversations, tell stories, inspire people to get involved, and uh, you know, I think we're at an age now where we want to make things inclusive, um, and that's what's important: is how do we use, um, you know, what's available to us and take this horizontal message and and kickstart activism through storytelling. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> So, so David, I also and there's I, no women on here. I notice. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All men. <laughs> I have long hair. That I pretend. <laughs> I could be the token. Um, I just. Um, I think it's also David. You represent this uh, kind of another another angle on this idea of taking um, activism and applying it to to causes or act. I should say action and applying them yeah. to causes. Right. Um, Riot.org does a beautiful job of telling the story and thus motivating people to take action and you've been somebody who's gone out there taking action and, yeah. and you know, creating a story and using that as a way to get other people to be informed and follow and, and become passionate. Uh, so you know, in a lot of ways a lot of similarities um, not to mention also using like everybody here in our virtual room uh, using the most cutting-edge technologies to, to help amplify those stories and share them. Yeah, I mean that's a that's something um, you know a big focus right now is how do we um, how do we take data for example you know where there's a there's a whole rush on data analytics and people are tracking us and snooping on us every single day but they're snooping on us because they want us to 
they want to take that data and, and to, to, to help us consume more. What happens if we flip that around and use that information to, you know, link the dots between the causes that matter and the people who care to start getting them to, you know, actually become actionists. You know, I, I always think we're these kind of armchair slacktivists in some way. You know, you get an email and it says, you know, I, you know, there's a cause on someone's Facebook page or, you know, you read it and then it says, you know, you should like it. But people don't really know what they're liking. A, I don't think we should like things. And maybe there should be a don't like button for these sort of things. But, you know, we sort of say, you know, I like this. And then, and then we don't even go to the website and connect and, and, and get our voices heard. And, you know, with the advent of obviously more mobile technology, cameras, transparency of storytelling, everyone is now a creator. So we've got to sort of figure out how do we curate, you know, the vast amounts of content to help us actually connect the dots between who's caring and, 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 and the institutions that can actually, you know, move on these causes. And I think that's where we can start to take the same techniques that are used to make us maybe shop more to actually become real activists. Bryn, I'm curious, what, what are you doing with data through Riot.org? Um, yeah, I mean, we're collecting it the same way, and we're really trying to find out what stories, you know, we, we have a, a, a pretty vast analytics that we can tell what stories are driving the people to do the most action. Um, David and I actually have been talking recently about, you know, finding ways to work together and, and, and to work on getting some, some more data to really be able to see what stories um, are driving people. And maybe it'd be interesting to hear from Tim, too, about, you know, what, what is it that drove people in his experience to the streets that he was seeing? You know, what is it that gets young people to go out there and to put their lives on the line? I mean, what is it with this generation that he's seeing? You know, maybe that's something Tim could say. Yeah, uh, I'm having some network problems, but uh, you can all hear me good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I feel like it's uh, something new. You know, new things give people hope. Uh, particularly with, uh, I mean, the massive protest actions we saw around the world in uh, from 2011 to 2012, and even now with what's happening in Turkey, there's sort of a, a spark that happens, and uh, I, I feel like with with Occupy Wall Street, there was this new, I mean, first of all, you had excitement from the Arab Spring, you had excitement from uh, Spain and and other European nations protesting. But then there was a new idea. It said, "We want to go down there, and we want to we want to occupy the space." And I, and I know it's not necessarily new, but it's something uh, you know new to this generation. Whereas most protests have been marches and signs. This was different. This wasn't intended to be for any one particular cause. It was just a gathering to give people sort of an alternative. Uh, that's the best way I understand it. And then with uh, with the, the journalism aspect of it. There were so many people who wanted to tell the story of what was happening, and whereas you know in the past it wasn't really even an option, you you wouldn't think about it. Now with uh, you know as uh, ubiquitous cell phone technology is, everyone's got means to post a tweet, a photo, a video. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people do. So now it's a no-brainer. Now you have to tell your story. So when more information is being shared, this event becomes more visible more people hear about it, more people get excited, and this, uh, you know, they, they say that uh, the Arab Spring was, was heavily influenced by Twitter and Facebook, the ability for the grassroots to, to share how involved they were. The way I see it, by putting up these events, photos, videos, other people who feel the same as you are now confident that someone, someone out there has their back. Uh, when they see all this conduct coming out, they think, I'm not alone, and now I'm confident enough to go and do something about it. You know, there are a lot of people who worry that um, in the immediacy of uh, Twitter and the internet and other forms of digital technology, that we lose some of that um, curation or some of the role of the traditional news organization to uh, mediate information and, and sort of fact check and choose the right things. What do you guys feel about that? Are we, are we really losing something with, without it going through the more traditional, experienced, journalistic uh, eyes, or uh, are we gaining something? Is this it's certainly different? For us, at, for us at Riot, it's a complete gaining something. I mean, we, we rely very heavily still on the AP and Reuters and, you know, the New York Times and great journalism out there, and we would never want that to go away. It's an it's essential part of what we do because we're able to really draw upon that. Um, but, you know, it's the, it's the plus. It's the addition of that. 
Um, I think as John was talking about with what's happening at Al Jazeera, it's really it's really an exciting thing. It was you know when you when you watch you know the control room documentary, for instance, and you see that there's these there's these new news sources that are popping up that are really trying to find themselves and to really tell the truth and to focus on that without that personality. That's fascinating. So that's a, I think a great addition to to what we're already working with. Yeah, about a about a year and a half ago. I was, I was talking to a lot of people about creating this network of citizen and independent journalists so that there would essentially be uh, someone available in every major city of the world, every city, you know, everywhere hopefully, so that when news breaks we've got live coverage, we've got Twitter feeds, we've got photo and video. And I guess it's, it's still, it was still a little early, but now there's a lot of interest and it seems to be what, uh, what most big organizations want to create. So I, I think they're, the, the big organizations are coming around to this is we need to organize this and make it as uh, have it serve as an asset to the production of news as opposed to worry about you know us losing our jobs it's 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 just a net positive for everybody definitely and and because news traditionally has been viewed as um, uh, not necessarily a profit center you know the, the ability now to be able to capture information in a really cost-effective way, I think, is, is because of these technologies is really important. I mean, Tim and I were talking the other day about, you know, you can pretty much achieve with an iPhone, a good Wi-Fi connection, and, his, and let's say a drone, that you can, you can achieve as the same as a, a news truck rolling up onto the street with, a, you know, a, a fifty or $100,000 ENG crew. You can pretty much accomplish the same thing. And so I've, I've, I'm really... I really feel energized by the ability that technology is now allowing for a lower cost production model that still can allow for that kind of quality. I fundamentally do believe though there is always going to be a need for edit editorial excellence and people um, who, who are going to be focused on the fact checking but I think that having a balance between those two things ultimately makes for a, a much more robust, a much more um, uh, participatory form of, of information sharing. I think it makes for a better world. I, I think, I, it, just to add one more quick point, it's like uh, like any any business, like any organization, when you're facing a changing marketplace, when you're changing a, a changing environment, a world, society, you have to, you know, you, you have to make sure you're still serving the people. So to the organizations that are worried about losing their traditional journalism or that they might lose their jobs, they're thinking about it, you know, all wrong. They, they should be adapting to how this is how this is changing and uh, change you know closing a door opening a window there's always an opportunity and you need to figure out how to use this to serve people to create something that will benefit uh, all of you know society all of our civilization that's you, you have to have a focus on the changing landscape you know I totally agree with all the sentiments I mean I think there's a you know I mean a lot of my my sort of work sits in the environmental space, which is an area for still some people a lot of debate. So one of the, you know, to play devil's advocate and throw it out there, one of the challenges I face is that there's a lot of disinformation in the space. It also spreads very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, what I love about the web is that, you know, and, and the dissemination of content, the decentralization of content is the self-correction. I mean, we've seen some of that, you know, used brilliantly across, you know, resources like Wikipedia and, you know, um, you know uh, other journalistic sites where you have, a re you know, early adopters who really control the content and, and, and are proud of it and fact check. But that's an interesting, you know, challenge as well is obviously how do we, how do we filter the, the amount and the vastness of the content and keeping on top of it, you know, and, 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 and trying to sort of make sure that, you know, the dissemination of in fact, the facts that aren't correct, that are very well organized by, you know, special interest groups as well, you know, that, that is, that, that is going to be, I think, one of the biggest challenges. And, you know, when you're small independent groups, you know, fighting for a, a cause and a voice, you know, there's sometimes, you know, a lot of organizations that want to um, and can organize and rally with a lot of money, especially in my space and the environment space. Um, against you, and that's been that's been one of the struggles that I've seen. Um, fortunately, as well, though, what we've also seen is as the you know the message is you know pushed out, as I say, more decentralized. What I'm loving is the fact that actually you now the message is the messenger, right? Or the messenger is the message rather, 
and whoever that person is, that's where you find your source and your truth um, in the individuals. And so it's been incredible to see it go from these big faceless organizations down to people that you trust, individuals. Um, so I think it's, you know, like everything is, you know, Tim said there's a, there's a challenge on both sides, right? It's like perpetuation of false content as well as, you know, just getting the content out there. And I think, you know, there's, there will be a self-correction that we'll see coming over time. Yeah, and I think that one to add to that, you know, what we saw in the newsroom most recently was that you know the Boston bombing and the aftermath of that. It was just you know so much misinformation was coming out there because everybody was trying to break that story as quick as possible, and there felt like there was a self-correction afterwards, where there was a pushback afterwards of saying you know, it, and and it wasn't just citizen you know journalists or people snapping pictures. It was the New York Post getting in trouble for it. So. I think that, that, that luckily that does right itself and you know one of the things that Tim what you're doing that's so fascinating to me and so important is I think in many ways you work as an advocate for these people who are um, taking pictures reporting from the scene who are just the person with the mobile phone is and John was saying what you can do on an iPhone is the same as a news van rolling up but you know I think what Tim's doing that's important is protecting those people who now are as important as a news van but they're just doing it with a, with a, with a Samsung Galaxy and uh, they don't need the news uh, news van anymore, so they have to be protected as well. I definitely love this idea that what we've what what has shifted is our um, focus in where we can place our trust. So it used to be that we would we trusted the nightly news anchor, and that's where we went and we believed whatever we we heard on that nightly news. Um, and now and our, we went to this place of of not trusting major institutions. Uh, the way we used to, and certainly we know they're all owned by corporate interests or influenced by who's spending the money on the ads. Um, and so now I think as a culture we've shifted to wanting to go back to believing in people we know or people that we've learned to trust. Um, David, I, I know the same thing's happening in the food movement, right? From, from agri-food to your local farmer. Like yeah. it, there's this growth of the, the local journalist, the, the citizen journalist who we can now kind of believe in. I, I'm more likely, I, I will trust Tim's reporting on event much more than I would uh, the ABC News. Um, and I just think that's part of a cultural trend that's been enabled again by the democratization of the internet. I totally agree. Mm. Yeah, the problem is we've got too many people agreeing in this room. <laughs> I just wouldn't trust whatever I say. I'm just like, I'm just like, the folks at home, and I definitely wouldn't trust Bryn, you know. Well, the, you know, speak, speaking of that, there, Thanks, there, there is the uh, the risk that you know we, we were uh, that David was just talking about with uh, false information. I know uh, I'm, I'm sure many people are familiar with during Hurricane Sandy, there was uh, somebody was was spreading false information. They were tweeting breaking news that was totally incorrect, and uh, that was that's really dangerous you know that's that's when when we have uh, you know a natural disaster occurring where people are relying on as much information as possible and I think because you know so, social media as a, as, a, as a new source is this new and exciting thing so people are just ready to to accept and people are generally trusting but I think you know this is again where we're going to need groups uh, uh, storyful uh, which is a really amazing organization they're they're fact checking the stuff they're making sure these videos are real uh, not being reposted, that's going to be really important, especially as this space grows. I think we're going to see, you know, as much good can come out of it. We're going to see, we're going to see bad come out of it too. I, I think another. I think it's totally right. I think one thing to think about is, you know, obviously people on the panel here more than me, but you know, it's also just also simple crediting of journalism. You know, I mean, just you know, like everyone's working hard to get good stories and. You know, and, and it's cool that it should be disseminated as quickly as possible, but it's sometimes nice. I see so many stories that are created by good, hard-working journalists, I'm sure, with Bryn and, and, you know, and John and Tim, and, you know. And I'm sure it pisses you off when someone just cuts and pastes it, reblogs it, tweaks it, doesn't even credit, you know. So that's another thing I think that has to, you know, the source as well, like making sure because you work hard to create sources of information that people trust. And it's a bummer when you, you find your blogs being totally hacked apart and twisted and changed and no one's crediting. So I, I love just get some thoughts on what you guys think about the sort of open source of like creative crediting and and the energy that goes into that and controlling you know just a little bit of like you know that's I think some of the self correction that's also needed. I'm I'm actually working on a, on an app right now with some really great uh, 
hackers in in New York City and even in San Francisco to solve this problem. Mm. I know, uh, you know, during Texas when the fertilizer plant went up, uh, a lot of photos and videos were just snatched up and reposted everywhere. Uh, there was another incident where AFP and Getty got sued because they lifted photos off someone's Twitter stream, uh, and and you know there are some other organizations. You know, most they just take the photos, they just repost them, and you know they don't give credit. Uh, but you know, and a lot of these people are hardworking journalists, and now you know the, the photojournalists I know who are who are you know many of them terrified because you know if we'll see uh, we see like the Chicago Sun Times just laid off their entire photojournalism staff. So they can train their their staff to you know they, they want to train their staff to use mobile. Uh, there, there's a risk, and so they're they're scared to upload photos without these massive watermarks blocking out the image to make sure that they don't have their your hard work stolen. It's it's. I'm working on it with a lot of really great people, and I, and I know that you know it's a problem that will be solved soon. Um, and I'm sure all of you guys have really great ideas to you know in, in the same space, but uh, you know making sure that people who are you know, risking their lives and and dedicating their lives. Uh, I, I would say the reason we need to credit them is so that we can build a trust in them. That way, you know, should someone break the information and we know this person, we know they're consistently good, we need to know who it came from. It definitely takes some time for both technology, legal system, and sort of cultural norms to catch up with, uh, you know, new innovations. I was doing some interesting reading a while ago about the history of copyright uh, and going back to the early days of the printing press uh, where at first what they would do is just um, printers would copy other people's books. There was sort of wild west. No one, there was no sense of ownership or control and the copyright laws developed out of trying to protect the rights of the writer, of authors and, and publishers to those rights for those books. So we're kind of in a similar time now. You know, then it was the printing press that enabled a certain kind of wild west or, or piracy. Um, and now we have this happening through you know, digital journalism or digital uh, photography. Uh, but I think eventually you know, some laws get passed, some, some norms get adopted, and then, and then the thing sort of sh settles in. Well, one, one startling and rather disturbing trend that we've seen is a growing sense of comfort with uh, plagiarizing material on, on college campuses. There's no doubt that, you, you know, just Google up something, cut and paste. The, the Internet is one giant copy machine. Um, anything can just easily be cut and pasted. And so I do feel a, a true, genuine sense of concern about um, a, a seemingly a growing lack of respect for for intellectual property and I'm not sure what the solution is to that. I have one question I'd like to ask this group. So there, so there was a major incident um, maybe three weeks or so ago where the AP was hacked and their uh, their Twitter account was hacked and it was blasted out to the world that the White House had been hit in some kind of an attack and that um, and that President Obama was hurt, and as a result, the market collapsed by two hundred billion dollars for i don 't know um, four or five minutes, I think it was before the the real story was um, came came out. But think about that for a minute. Um, a hacker group basically caused a two hundred billion dollar um, collapse of of a market uh, of of a few different markets and so that kind of thing seems to be um, inevitable. Uh, we'll see more of that kind of uh, kind of activity, I would imagine. Um, and I'm curious, what do um, what do you think about that? The, you know, the idea that all news is not equal, um, but you know, uh, people trust the AP. You know, if AP tweets that the White House is hit before anyone else, and you know. so I'm curious about what does. Um, uh, that filtering mechanism that needs to occur, I think, is a real challenge. But what are your what are your general thoughts on that? Uh, I'll jump in. You know, I, that was a really that was really fascinating to watch. I mean, for us, it was just uh, it was an indication that there was uh, that things were changing, um, and and that there was a way that young people could be disruptive of uh, the sort of the status quo about it, and it had far-reaching effects. Um, so, you know, I think it's something that, that people are paying close attention to and it's shifting and it's going to shift a little bit of power 
away from maybe the, the those big sort of stalwart organizations before. Mm. You know, I I um I'm I'm if I was to wear my conspiracy hat, I would say there's probably a mafia group who just made a lot of money on the trade um, mm -hmm. somewhere. Maybe that maybe that's something to think about, right? <laughs> no so doubt. Yeah. No you doubt. know, no doubt someone's figured that one out, and we're and they're sitting there going, "Bam, watch that." Um, I don't know. I mean, it's almost like you you know when when you're you know a horrible um, you know, dyslexic speller who's got ADD and wants to move really fast, like me. You know, you you set up like um, you know, on on your Google account, your email, you have a delay for like three minutes. You know what I mean? And it has to go through. So sometimes when I hit send, I can actually oh, you know, and I can see it, and I can check it, I can jump back in. It's almost like there needs to be, and you know, it sounds like Tim, you're working on something, some sort of like almost like a Watergate kind of like as a story breaks. There needs to be some kind of like intranet between all the news agencies. And there needs to be almost like you know one or two people have to credit a story, say, yeah, this is backed up. Like it almost has to go through. And I know that's kind of counterintuitive to the idea of disseminating content quickly, but maybe there's some like you know almost sort of internal like conversations. Say, all right, John, if a story breaks, we're gonna we're gonna work together, and we know that whenever something breaks, it's a magnitude that could affect on a wide level. We'll authenticate each other in the sense that we'll 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 say this is a re you know we'll put a blast out to confirm that you know and and it's hard when you're you're still I mean it shows you how we all still look you know like the moth around the light we still look to those big monoliths those big organizations for our content but as that changes it'll be less damaging you know when it's more centralized and there's many more voices people will question that but then you know it's really hard to do as I said you know I think. Mm. That, that there's going to be part technology, part just human spirit, and 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 you know, it's it's you know it's not worked out yet. That's for sure. Um, okay. But you know, I can tell I, you when when news breaks, I'm calling you guys <laughs> <laughs> to find out whether I can trust it or not. Um, well, I think uh, uh, this I, I, been, I, I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say this has been a great conversation, and I hate to cut it off, uh, but we've we've sort of run through our time and then a little bit. Uh, so I look forward to many more group conversations with you guys. Um, I want to remind everybody to come attend Future Storytelling Summit, October 3rd. I hope to see everyone there. Uh, and uh, check back in with us each week for, for our continued roundtable conversation uh, schedule. So thank you, everyone, so thank kindly you. for being part of this. It was really fun. Uh, I wish we were... We could all just go down to the corner and have a bar, you know, drink at the bar and keep the conversation yeah, going. Definitely. Uh, Maybe we should spread a rumor. <laughs> should we just get online and start tweeting something? We can make something up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. Obviously, I'm the worst sense of humor in the group. Don't invite me again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks Thank, for you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.